go over to uh, uh, David Palava. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've cut this paper some, and if time allows, I'd like to slip two more paragraphs back in, so I'll flag that uh, and put it up here. <laughs> I want to discuss why it makes sense to speak of a linguistic turn in the philosophy of Paul Ricoeur. The first thing that needs to be said is that Ricoeur never adopted the characteristic emphasis of analytical, analytic philosophy that making sense of the logical proposition is the key to a philosophy of language. There are a number of reasons why Ricoeur did not go in this direction. First of all, he was not interested in logic as a specific topic of inquiry. Nor did he ever accept the goal of making sense of ordinary language by showing that it could be derived from an underlying logical atomism. Nor did he accept Frege's elimination of the problem of predication. I mean especially the problem of existential predication through the idea of a predicative function. And while he would have respected the insights into the distinction between names and descriptions, gained through the analysis of different forms of logical structure, of the logical structure of the proposition, it would have been the question of naming rather than of the possible distinctions to be drawn among kinds of names that he would have seen as posing the most significant philosophical problem. Ricoeur did appropriate certain key terms from the analytic tradition and put them to his own use. One can cite here his use of Frege's distinction between sense and reference in the rule of metaphor and of Peter Strassen's notion of basic particulars and their role in identifying reference in both rule of metaphor and oneself as another. But he never really discussed these authors' arguments for these ideas, nor would he have claimed to be using them in just the sense meant by their original authors were that critique to be raised against his use of these notions. In fact, he set aside the emphasis on sense and reference from rule of metaphor in favor of the threefold distinction between figuration, configuration, and reconfiguration in time and narrative, and any reference to Strassen pretty well disappears in his subsequent work. What I want to consider next, therefore, is how it does make sense to apply this idea of a linguistic turn to Ricoeur's philosophy, but also to show that we have to understand Ricoeur's own linguistic turn not as a simple change of mind, but rather as a process that unfolds over time. There are precursor non-analytic influences to be found in his fascination with the spoken word and, his interpret and in his interpretive studies of the problem of signification in Husserl. However, to give a more definite specification to Ricoeur's own linguistic turn, I want to propose that it first clearly occurs at the end of the symbolism of evil, with the declaration following the hum hermeneutic turn that occurs in this book that philosophy needs to attend to the fullness of language. His readers know that this conclusion came from his project of understanding how people in fact seek to make sense of the existence of evil its origin, and its possible end through attending to their use of a confessional language when they speak about evil. What Ricoeur saw was that this is a kind of language that makes use of the notions of myth and symbol, where a symbol is defined by the fact that it always conveys more than one meaning, and a myth is a narrative unfolding of some of the possible meanings conveyed through a symbol or a combination of symbols. Hence, this is a kind of language that differs from the ideal of the unequivocal logical proposition or the unambiguous scientific assertion, and that cannot be reduced to them. Following this inquiry into a specific kind of symbolic language, that used to try to make sense of evil, Ricoeur sought next to generalize beyond the specific kind and use of a confessional language which had to be appropriated by the philosopher through reenacting it, using one's imagination in order to understand it, rather than by some form of logical analysis. In doing this, he began to see that a philosophy attentive to the fullness of language, and which sought to think starting from the fullness of language, had to acknowledge and take seriously the existence of figurative language. 
Initially, this inquiry took the form of trying to generalize from the implicit theory of symbol and symbolic language used in the symbolism of evil. We can see from the essays collected in the conflict of interpretations, this led to the idea of a symbolic function underlying any general system of signs and through this to the claim that any philosophy of language must be one that considered language as one such sign system. From this insight followed the recognition that a philosophical inquiry into language, which would lead to a philosophy of concrete reflection, must be a philosophy that has to start from both what it is people say and how they say it. The course search for the fullness of language, therefore, had to focus on language in terms of both its structure and its use. This was an inquiry that would be given shape through his encounter with structuralism and structural linguistics, more through his encounter with structuralism and structural linguistics than through his appropriation of analytic philosophy. Indeed, we can say that Ricoeur's own linguistic term from this point on turned out to be more influenced by developments in linguistics than it was by work in philosophical logic or even the ordinary language philosophy associated with Oxford and some American philosophers. Although along the way, he did draw several key insights from this work. His next step was the insight that, a theory of lang that the theory of language coming from Saussure had to be expanded to include not just the focus on the structure of language as a system of signs, it also had to address language as used in speaking. Long as the underlying structure of any language is surely operative in speech, but it is also something abstract, something objectified as an atemporal methodological construct, rather than derived from any particular natural language as actually used. Saussure's great discovery was to have laid the basis for a general linguistics, but not to fully unfold it. He did so through postulating a model for language as a system of signs, where the constitutive basis of this system or structure lay not in independently existing signs, but in the differences among the signs. This meant that linguistic signs at the level of the lexicon did not exist independently of one another, but only through their relations among themselves. Ricoeur was less satisfied with the claim that language as thus constituted was a closed system. This claim was derived from the further assumption that the signs in question had an internal structure which divided them into a signifier and a signified. He saw that this meant eliminating any possibility of a referential dimension to language if reference was to be understood as about something external to and even prior to language. Ricoeur took this postulated closure to mean that in language so understood, nothing in fact was said. Hence, there was no meaning either. Only perhaps the possibility of meaning if the signs in question could be shown to be put to use by someone to say something about something to someone in some concrete situation. This brings us to the next moment in Ricoeur's linguistic term, drawing on Emile Bonvenis's assertion that an acceptably scientific theory of language as used to say something through speech was in fact possible, Ricoeur saw that a philosophy that intends to take seriously the fullness of language has to be a philosophy that includes a theory of discourse, where discourse first occurs at the level of the set, a sentence, not at that of words in the dictionary, or as the signs in what Saussure designated as the formal system of Long. Pursuing this insight took Ricoeur through a number of sub subsequent steps that we can summarize as follows. First comes a general characterization of discourse as the use of language by someone to say something about something to someone. Obviously, it is here in discourse that we find a speaker, an audience, a situation, a code, and a message. Discourse is thus where language is meaningful in the sense Ricoeur was seeking. It says something about the world, the people in it, 
the way things are or were, and the way things and the ways they might be. To this basic characterization of discourse, next was added the insight that discourse too has a structure. But it is a structure that differs from and is not reducible to the individual words that compose any sentence. A sentence is not simply a sequence of words. It has a structure, but this is a structure constituted through the act of predication. Given Ricoeur's commitment to the fullness of language, this meant considering predication as operative in every form of discourse, not simply in those assertions that can be analyzed or reformulated as logical propositions. Ricoeur was able to draw on analytic philosophy in expanding this point. He drew from the analytic philosophy of action, for example, the insight that so-called action sentences are ones that ascribe a meaning to an action or assign the action to an agent rather than ones that predicate a property to a logical subject. The importance of this point regarding the meaningfulness of the wide variety of kinds of discourse that can be expressed already at the level of a single sentence is further evident in Ricoeur's work on metaphor. Metaphor, contrary to traditional accounts and many contemporary accounts, is not simply a question of substitution of one word for another. Metaphor, at least in the case of live metaphor, occurs at the level of the sentence through an act of impertinent predication. Unlike the logical proposition, which by definition is either true or false, and must be one of them, a metaphor something says something both is and is not the case at the same time. Ricoeur drew three important conclusions from this. First, live metaphors can be a source of new meaning, of semantic innovation. This is why, while they can be paraphrased, they cannot be directly translated into a literal, that is, a univocal or single truth-valued logical proposition without loss. Second, over time, metaphorical expressions can enter ordinary use. They can become a familiar way of saying things. And finally, be absorbed into the dictionary through a process of lexicalization that assigns new possible meanings to a word or words found there. In effect, live metaphors can metaphorically die. But dead metaphors do not really reveal the symbolic power of live metaphors to suggest new meaning. Third, because metaphorical discourse is meaningful, intelligible, a philosophy that takes the fullness of language seriously will have to take into consideration the possibility of a metaphorical truth. This is a truth that redescribes reality in a new way, unlike the descriptions that are captured by the logical proposition's ability to assign an existing, already recognizable property or relation to an already known subject term. Furthermore, metaphors can extend beyond the length of a single sentence, as can any instance of discourse. Hence, the symbolic function and possibility of semantic innovation at work in metaphor may carry over to examples of such extended discourse, discourse that involves more than a single sentence. The next step in Ricoeur's exploration of, lang of language as discourse, therefore, was to turn to this idea of extended discourse, where such extended discourse may carry the redescriptive capacity found in a live metaphor. As already stated, discourse first occurs at the level of a sentence, not that of the word. Words in the dictionary are polysemic, they usually have more than one meaning, and those meanings may differ greatly among themselves. It is discourse, the act of saying something, that, so to speak, filters these meanings through the act of predication without necessarily producing a univocal statement. Most discourse, in fact, is plurivocal, not univocal, but not, for all that, unintelligible. Indeed, the idea of a univocal act of discourse may at best be a regulative idea. This is why there is always a, quest a question of interpretation that arises. 
This is something complicated by the use of the same act of discourse in different situations. But that there may always be a contextual factor to consider is not what is most important about what Ricoeur says about discourse. What is important for the fullness of language is that the forms of extended discourse can be cataloged in terms of different genre or styles of, or types of extended discourse. Hence, a theory of discourse needs to attend to these different forms and what accounts for their specificity as a form of discourse. Of course, it also needs to acknowledge that any instance of extended discourse within such a genre is unique in its own way. It has a style that individualizes it, which also needs investigation. And genres of discourse can overlap, intersect, even be intermingled, complicating the act of interpreting their meaning. Ricoeur recognized six forms of extended discourse, although in no case, except perhaps for narrative, can his characterization be said to be anything like complete. And here I'll try to add in what I cut out. They are poetic discourse, narrative discourse, religious discourse, political discourse, legal discourse, and most problematically, philosophical discourse. Poetic discourse is the broadest form, the one closest to what Ricoeur thought of as expressing a symbolic function. As such, it is discourse in which semantic innovation, something new it being said for the first time, occurs. In this sense, it can be present in all the other forms I have enumerated, insofar as they are all capable of saying something new. Narrative discourse is the form discussed at the greatest length by Ricoeur, and perhaps the form most familiar to his readers. It is constituted by the fact that it has a plot that configures what was already figured in existing language, particularly the language meant to provide a network of concepts that can make sense of human action. It is discourse that configures a series of episodes where something may or may not happen into a single story or history where something meaningful happens. As such, narrative discourse is a necessary form of discourse in that without it, we cannot really make sense of time in all its complexity or even the meaning of action over time even if the solution achieved is practical rather than theoretical to use the Kantian distinction. Religious discourse is a kind of second order discourse that can make use of many different forms of extended discourse. For example, narrative, law, prophecy, lamentation, praise, wisdom, proclamation. It is a kind of poetic discourse one whose specificity stems from the fact that, at least for the biblical traditions, it serves to name God and to proclaim a message of hope through what Ricoeur calls its logic of superabundance. Political discourse is specified by its fragility, owing to its inherent rhetorical nature and its tie to ideology as a way of both resolving and concealing its claim to authority as the power to command others and to make a legitimate use of force and violence. In a word, political discourse is both itself conflictual and a use of language meant to resolve conflicts, where the question as to who should rule or why or even how can always be reopened. At the limit, it is closely tied to the question of what constitutes the social bond that allows people to live peacefully together. <clears throat> Legal discourse is perhaps the least clearly distinguished form of extended discourse in Ricoeur's philosophy of language. <clears throat> but something at least like a first specification of such discourse can be discerned in his late essays on the just. He sees the specificity of this form of discourse to lie in the role assigned to a neutral third party who has to pass judgment whether when there is a dispute or tort or crime, along with the rules governing what counts as evidence and argumentation in pleading for such a judgment and in the setting, in the setting of the trial court. I come back to my paper. Philosophical discourse is finally the most problematic form and the one least directly addressed by Ricoeur. 
although we can find a few hints concerning it in his work. It is problematic because it is the discourse that formulates his theory of discourse. Hence, it runs into all the problems that find their analogs on the side of analytic philosophy regarding sets that include themselves, or the still broader question whether a language can contain its own meta-language. Ricoeur suggests two things about philosophical discourse that are worth noting. First, it is characterized by reflexivity. Philosophical discourse can be discourse about discourse. Ricoeur understands this problem of reflexivity in a larger sense than simply a question of how language allows us to use language to talk about language. We can see this in those places where he invokes his allegiance to the French tradition of a reflexive philosophy, where what is at stake is the very fact that human existence is characterized, even constituted, by the capacity for self-reflection. It is his commitment to this wider problem of reflection or reflexivity that sets a limit to his own linguistic term. It is why he finally he came finally to see that while philosophy must attend to language, that this is a necessary and unavoidable step for contemporary philosophy. Simply paying attention to language, even the fullness of language, is not sufficient for what is at stake in philosophy. Why he could say that, quote, not everything is language, but nothing in experience arrives at meaning unless it is born by language. It is why I believe he was willing to say that at the limit, philosophical discourse is finally speculative discourse. More could and should be said of all, about all this, of course, but the limits of time impose themselves. Let me conclude by suggesting that Ricoeur's own linguistic term, with its emphasis on taking seriously the fullness of language, including figurative language, sets us the task of reopening the question, what do we mean by literal language? This is something which we philosophers may take too much for granted, if not as simply given and unproblematic. Thank you. Another part I cut out, a little discussion of Rorty. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, Rorty edited this well-known anthology called The Linguistic Churn, and in it he says that this new emphasis in philosophy was one where, quote, philosophical problems are problems which may be solved or dissolved either by reforming language or by understanding more about the language we presently use. I, I see Ricoeur as accepting the second part of that statement, a better understanding language, but not by saying we answer philosophical problems by reforming language. I think that was one thing. I think the other thing that's crucial here is this notion of semantic innovation. It's, it's well known that Wittgenstein says philosophy doesn't change language. He simply has no place for this possibility of new meaning in language. 
And, and so the question would come down to why is this notion of semantic innovation so important for Ricoeur? Um, and there I think I would say it's a, it's a tacit theological presupposition here. He wants the possibility of a word of God as something new. I mean, that's what semantic innovation would really give us. It also gives us at a more mundane level, the sort of McIntyre level, the possibility that communities can change and improve themselves over time by discovering, finding ways to formulate new meaning. That one gets into hard question. Other recent conferences have heard me of people who like the notion of creativity in Ricoeur. I'm very cautious on that notion. I don't think simply invoking the notion that language can be creative solves all the problems. You have to slow down and talk about what you're doing there. But so those two things, that, that language, you could not reduce philosophy to language, and we had to somehow account for the possibility of semantic innovation, of new meaning. I think is what ultimately shapes his linguistic turn and his appropriation of what he saw was useful in the, in the English-speaking philosophy. Yes, uh, I have a question on um, having uh, gone over his, his... Could you stand up? I have very bad ears. So. Um, <laughs> so I have a question on um, your thoughts on, on his uh, work on metaphor. Um, starting with rule of metaphor, and he's focusing very much on um, this on the level of the sentence and how they operate, and and using Frege and using Max Black. And when he starts to, it's it's almost he, he's not interested in metaphor as such as in a metaphor in a sentence, but this a metaphor trajectory, how metaphors operate, and his his end game is expanding that to. Uh, an understanding of how, as you say, extended discourse would would use metaphor, and then as he goes into religious discourse, almost how that same metaphor trajectory operates intertextually between discourses. My question is, um, I, in my reading, I start to get slightly uncomfortable with with how he's expanding um, what was a very sort of concise theory that some people have said is a misappropriation of of um, of Frege with the sense and reference, do you think it works that he keeps sort of making it bigger and bigger and bigger, that what works for a sentence works for discourse in general and works for interdiscourse? No. no I, I, I want to be careful there. I, that, I guess two points in response to you. First, the second one. It seems to me one of the great insights in Ricoeur's philosophy is that against analytic philosophy is that the analysis of extended discourse cannot be reduced to the analysis of single sentences or even or propositions. That in effect, the question of truth, and meaning, both meaning and truth come in here. If we take an, an instance of extended discourse like a historical text, the truth of a historical text is not simply the logical conjunction of the truth of the individual sentences. In fact, the historical text can contain false sentences and still be a true history. The philosophy of history needs to make sense of that. And so, in a way, you have a, a kind of very strong notion here that logical analysis as propositional analysis and even as conceptual analysis, which what I would say is the level of the word, is inadequate to making sense of interpreting extended discourse. I think English language philosophers simply haven't heard this, they don't understand it, they, they would reject it if you told them this because they don't, they don't see it, so that's one point. The other goes back to what got lost in Roy's question here about relativism. It's this question of can a philosophy of language get away with pervosity over against univocity? And, and I think it turns on this notion of language can be, in what ways can language be intelligible? And it's sorting that out for meaning a bit, that we don't simply to say, as he said against structuralism, it's an interesting method, it does certain things, logical analysis of concept, conceptual analysis, propositional analysis does certain things, but it's inadequate to the full intelligibility of language. 
And, and that's something that has not been, in my mind, appropriated enough out of his philosophy of language. Where it goes, that's the question that keeps his philosophy alive, in my mind. Okay. I'm not sure I understood your first question. Uh, the second question is a very uh, of why is it that extend there is no such thing as pure extended discourse. I mean, conceptually, there is. It's longer than a sentence. It, it has certain structures. That extended discourse always, as I say, can be cataloged. It takes certain forms, and those forms may be culturally shaped. Um, you know, is, is that a transcendental claim that we can enumerate the possible forms of extended discourse or are we talking about empirical, culturally based forms? He seems to say that narrative, narrative is the one, one form that is transcultural. Although I, I did once hear Clifford Geertz try and deny this to his face and, and record didn't quite believe him, but uh, something about shadow plays in Bali or something. Um, so why is it that, but I think it's back to the second question here, that extended discourse is structured in some way. We have to make sense of that structure. And, and so you have this very unique recur language of the specificity of discourse. Not the essence of something, but how do we specify it? And, and I think one can, one can make, begin to make too many distinctions is the other problem there within this. But, so what are the basic forms of extended discourse? I would start at an empirical level that a culture, a tradition recognizes. Then raise this question of what specifies these different forms of discourse what distinguishes them from another. And going the other way, as I said, you can, you can combine. The, the, the metaphors get come fast and furious here. Forms of discourse can intersect. They can overlap. They can be embedded within one another. Sitting in the seminary, it's interesting that the giving of the law at Sinai is the legal discourse is embedded in a narrative. <laughs> And, and in order to make sense of that discourse, you have to make sense of both those forms of discourse and how they play off one another. And so we don't have a general theory of extended discourse. I think that's, if we understand that, if I'm right, this is what Ricoeur discovered the need for. We, he left us with, with work to do on this. And, and to do it, we have to, against analytic philosophy, we have to move away from that kind of logical analysis. Uh, 
um, to, to make sense of it. Now, the, the tradition in the West, at least, gives us rhetoric <laughs> as the way to do that. So I have been looking at Ricoeur's, what I would call his broken dialogue with Hayden White on history. <laughs> Um, and the tropes and the theory of tropes in the discourse but but I think what undercuts the rhetoric is this notion of semantic that tropological reading in white is this possibility of semantic innovation that it, impossible, it is possible to have new forms of extended discourse um, you, not until you have them you don't know this but it is possible and the example he cites is the, is the novel, that the novel is, in some sense, a new form of extended discourse within narrative. Um, and so, again, sort of an empirical question here. What, 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 are, what are the possible forms of extended discourse? What are the possible innovations in extended discourse that might give rise to a new entry in our catalog of extended discourse. I, I, those are open questions to me. I, I don't have an answer to the question beyond that. Ah, I can't! <laughs> here, here, no, you're, this is the second time in my life I've met this woman. <laughs> this is Kit Blamey, my co-translator. <laughs> Four minutes left. All right, I'm kids' question. We'll continue uh, without that because Pascal Engel is part of us, but you have to start at 20 past three, right? So, um, <laughs> um, I'll have two quick uh, questions. No, and the, I, I, the I was only going to say organizing the social extended discourse um, so it requires talking about the work. And once you talk about the work, then you can bring in writing and the fact that you have uh, a novel, you have a history, you have a poem, you have a dialogue, you have all of these um, units mm -hmm. of discourse, um, which can then lend themselves to all of the, the, the sort of formal types of analysis that you started with at the beginning, like structuralism and so forth. So Ricoeur brings them all back together. It's not that just he takes one step and then goes from structuralism to Benvenis' notion of, of discourse and so on. He then goes back because yes, structuralism too uh, will be helpful in, in negotiating uh, mm -hmm. uh, with these larger units. I, I agree about that. Um, and then I just want to say one little thing. I was listening to the Logical <laughs> Theory before I came, and they're having a week uh, de devoted to recur and so on, but we won't hear it because we'll be there. Um, and someone was talking about uh, recur's you know, sort of joyfulness and the joking around and so forth, and that he referred um, at the end of uh, his career to himself as an obsedé.